Hey yo, what's up? It's your boy Chanda and Bao, and we're back with another episode of Zambian Hip Hop History. On this one, we get to speak to a well-storied individual, a gentleman who's known for a multifaceted set of talents, a legend in the game by many, many avenues. You know, some know his famous voice, <laughs> which we've heard on various, various channels, including radio, including TV. Um, and some also know him for his amazing music career as well. Some know him as an author. So a very multifaceted gentleman and we're very, very happy to have the pleasure to speak with him today. A big shout out and a big welcome to Chilu Lemba. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for having me, man. I mean, this is a great series. It's a great initiative and salute to you for doing it because I've been hearing over the years people whispering like, we want to do this, we want to do that. And you just made it happen, you know. So you, you I, like, uh, it's, it's a very noble cause to document this stuff for posterity. So well done. No, thank you so much, man. And you, you, you know, you hit the nail on the head. It's just kind of, I feel like I, I could, I, I don't want to obviously disparage this in any way here, but I feel like as Zambians, we're not particularly disciplined about documenting our stuff. You know, I feel like yeah, we, yeah. We're, we're too comfortable with kind of organically living it and then kind of hoping yeah. that I guess the memory will propagate itself through the word of mouth or through the stories that, that are told. But, yeah. you know, I, I feel like some, you know, I, obviously I'm not going to answer all the all the questions or I'm not going to like you know, be the solution for everything. But I felt like, look, in my own little way, in my own little corner, let me try yeah. and continue. As a patriot. <laughs> Definitely, man. We, yeah, I feel it's just something that we all have to do in our own little walks of life. Absolutely. So thank you for blessing us with some time. You know, we we know that there's going to oh, be tons you. of gems from you. You know, we're, we're obviously, first of all, very proud of everything you've contributed to the game and very grateful. So, uh, so yeah, so I mean, look, I, you know, thank you for following. I, I'm pretty sure you know the format of what we do. So it's very conversational. Yeah. And what we'd like to do is just kind of unravel your journey. Um, and obviously, you know, I, I first knew you in my, my kind of sphere of things and what you do professionally in terms of voice, right? Voice and also, you know, recently, yeah. more recently being an author. Um, and so, you know, it would be great to understand your journey with music and, and, and hear about when you first uh, fell in love with music, maybe, and when you first decided that you would uh, do some music. And then also hearing about the multiple journeys. Yeah. So, in fact, when I started out, I was more passionate about music and, and songwriting. I was a rapper from the time I was about eight years old. Wow. And that, that's I think when I wrote my first rap and, and also <laughs> obviously there's if I put it into context man that's like 1983 84 wow, no, that, that long ago so so it's been wow. uh, like a lifelong passion and um, the radio and voiceover stuff uh, came later on in life you know when okay. uh, uh, you, you know initially you start with dreams of being a rapper initially you have dreams of one day getting a Grammy initially yeah. you have all these things and then reality hits you BAM <laughs> <laughs> how much how much money are you making right now at this moment you know and and as a guy in his late teens um, I think that's when my antennas went up and I realized I had to start you know looking for other opportunities yeah. and uh, then radio happened um, in 96 Mm. Um, and then from radio, you know, all these other things, voiceover and whatnot uh, came about. But because of the fact that I'm still passionate about um, music, rap, my first love, you know, I still mm. once in a while find time to do projects um, which yeah. are linked to that. Because um, the way I see it, a lot of the voiceover stuff lives for a limited time. You know what I mean? Mm. If you're doing a, a, mm. an ad for argument's sake, Edgar's, the Edgar's yeah. sale, now on, you know. Um, yeah. That thing will will last like two weeks before yeah. the sale, mm -hmm. you know. But it's not evergreen. It's, it won't stay for generations. Whereas with the music stuff, gotcha. um, some of the songs that I did like you know uh, ten years ago are still being played on radio and so on. So mm -hmm. um, I still find time to to make music uh, because it's it's another avenue in which I can uh, fulfill my passion, I suppose. No, th thank you for that. And, and I'd love to know, I mean, I guess growing up as a teen and, you know, in the 80s, who were some of your big influences that made you say, man, I, I love this hip hop stuff or I'm into this hip hop stuff? Yeah. Well, I think for a bunch of us who were um, born in the 70s and were, were consuming media in the 80s, there were a couple of movies 
that kind of uh, you know shifted our focus to to the culture, so to speak. So one of them obviously was uh, Breakdance, the movie, which uh, was filmed in the early '80s, cheesy as hell, but it it impacted me because besides the breakdancing, that's where I first saw Ice T because Ice T had a little cameo, I think, in Breakdance, the movie too. And I was like, what's this guy doing, you know? And, and then that sticks with you. And then later on, you, you find guys who start bringing in music um, from overseas, uh, you know, rap tapes and so on. So um, initially, uh, I, I started gravitating to guys like Run DMC, you know, because they had that swag, you know, arms folded and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, then though, later on, it was LL Cool J, uh, you know, and then from there, you start getting exposed to guys who aren't really mainstream rappers, you know, MC Breed and, and all these other guys who people might not know. But th those are the kind of guys that back in the day I looked out to and looked up to. Wow, that's, uh, that, you, you just uh, touched on some things I never heard of. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you don't know who MC Breed is. You'll be Googling no clue, after this. <laughs> man, no clue, but hey, this, this is, you know, the thing I love about this exercise is you know, I, I, I was explaining to, to one of the guests that I, I, I by no means consider myself an authority figure, but I just have that passion. Mm. And I think part of the interesting aspect of this journey for me is that I'm learning alongside the audience, you know, so so I, yeah, I, I'm yeah, definitely approaching yeah. this with a lot of humility because there's a lot I don't know. But um, but thank no, you for I'm, that. I'm learning, too. <laughs> <laughs> No, and, and so I guess having said that, you know, learning from or being inspired by, you know, Breakdance, the movie, the MC Breeze of the world, you know, would you say that that, I guess, pushed you in a certain direction musically? Was there something that you said, man, you know, if I pursue music or when I pursue music, this is what I believe I yeah. should stand for or this is kind of like, because I know like a lot of people who talk about, let's say, public enemy, right? That's very kind of politically yeah. conscious yeah. and you know what I mean? So was there any of those aspects like thematic kind of considerations for you in the early journey i think initially with most people the journey starts off with you just kind of trying to imitate the people that you yeah. listen to yeah and so it's not as if um your agenda or, or your you know any theme pops up initially yeah um so that was the same when when i was growing up i mean we started a rap group called the fabulous four mm. with uh, my late brother kumbu and mm. uh late friend Ryan Glazy and his brother Monga who's still mm. about and at the time it was just like you know the fat boys in the US are doing this we can also you know do something cool like that mm. but as you start learning and understanding and reading and, and consuming different things in life which start shaping your perspective on things then you start uh, kind of fashioning your music towards that mm. with me what happened is in 1991 Mm -hmm. There's a, a, a group from the UK called Beats International who at the time were popping. Okay. And they came to tour Zambia. Okay. So when they arrived, uh, because of the giving people that they were, I, you probably, you might know um, Norman Cook now. He, he Ooh, goes okay. by the name Fatboy Slim in certain okay. circles. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was the, he, the band leader of Beats International. Huh. And because of their giving attitude, they had a rap workshop at International School, which was sponsored by the British Council. Huh. And so me... My two brothers gate crashed it. Yeah. And while there, you know, we, we met up with uh, like a bunch of people who today you might know, you know, guys like Tivo, Shika Pasha, um, Honorable Kelvin Sampa, uh, Viv Langa, and a whole bunch of other people. And Norman Cook and them were on stage. Mm -hmm. And intermittently, they would ask guys to come up and rap. Huh. So the DJ would be on the turntables, yeah. guys would rap. As at the close of the workshop, uh, yeah. one of the guys from Beats International said, um, it's all good that you guys are imitating the U.S. people, but okay. you need to start doing African stuff so that, mm. uh, you know, guys can start uh, identifying you by your identity. Yeah. And at the time, you know, there was that whole movement in the U.S. where guys would be wearing like uh, little medallions with the African uh, ah, map yeah, on them. Yeah, there was yeah, this yeah. whole African movement. So, yeah. so one of the things you were saying is um, it's a pity or oh, it would be tragic if um, the guys who look to Africa for inspiration are seeing um, themselves, uh, having you guys imit yeah, you know, imitating them as yeah. opposed to seeing something original. Yeah. And so that's when, as we were going back home, uh, my brother Kumbu, uh, my elder brother Stwala, mm. we're just kind of discussing like, but then how do you make music African? You know, yeah, and we're having yeah. these conversations. Is it in the the beat? Uh, which Swala was convinced about. I was thinking it's within the lyrics and the choruses and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the seed was planted. So in 92, 
I wrote uh, a song which had like uh, some Bemba, some Nyanja, some English. Um, and, you know, a few years later when I met up with Alan Vula, aka MC Suicide, who's now DJ Life, um, that's kind of when we were able to, to shape the song and put it on radio. And it was, turns out to be the first radio song that had uh, Vinak and English mashed up. Uh, the song was called Zambia Moto and it was huge on radio back in 1994. So that that's like a little, you know, story which I've kind of abridged. <laughs> a lot yeah. of it is in my book. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, that's, that's kind of, uh, so in terms of what the themes were, the themes uh, kind of were, at the bedrock of them were okay, they had the, something had to be African about it, um, yeah. you know, because of relevance. But then um, there were also, I suppose, I mean, like Zambia Moto itself was a song which was, um, or the foundation of it was because at that time the country was moving from um, a singular politics to multi party yeah. politics. Yeah. And there was this whole wave about change coming and yeah. hope coming. So <laughs> the hour that's, has that's come. Kind of the messages that would be injected in the music, you know. Yeah, the hour had come, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember so, that. So, so, yeah. so that's kind of, you know, what 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 uh, what, it, what it was back then. And over the years, even the uh, the, the next song that I did, which kind of um, had a good reception, uh, which was on the Rhythm Nation project uh, called Shivuka. Same kind of message, different kind of approach, but mm. also hope, you know, uh, and, and that's kind of where I started uh, pushing the music to okay. during that period. Okay. So the first single then Actually, was 94? Not, yeah, 94, yeah, 94. Okay. We didn't release it uh, per se, you know, we didn't put it out, but it was on radio. And okay. that was 1994, and the song was called Zambia Moto. Moto. And then uh, in 2000, uh, 2000, I actually recorded it in 99 when it was released in 2000. That was uh, Shibuka. Some yeah. people call it Kamale because of the chorus, and that was on the Rhythm Nation, Nation project, project by Wonder Music. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's funny because should I just reach out? I've got this Rhythm Nation project. Oh, no CD way. Here, no. The way. actual CD. You got, oh, my <laughs> Lord. I remember <laughs> that. That's crazy. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. Man. That's a dope throwback. <laughs> and, and I also, yeah. I mean, as I understand it, you also have full projects to your name. I believe there's three or four, yeah. correct? So there is. Mm -hmm. I've got them too. I'm just wondering, should I reach out and like leave camera? <laughs> I should have just brought them closer to me, but let me reach out. Oh, man. Getting old. But yeah, so, so this was uh, Sound Legacy. Oh, Sound Legacy. Yeah, that's so Sound the first Legacy one, right? was 2006. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah, okay. that was the first the full five. album. Okay. Okay. And then flowers, needles, and drum beats, mm. uh, which was check. This is still in the plastic, bro. Yeah. Wow. Been open. Collectors. But I, this was 2012. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this is the one that had. Uh, it's it's got 13 tracks, but the one that blew up from here was uh, Njota. Njota. Yeah. Um, with TK, who produced it. Um, you know, and then Romaside Sessions wasn't released as a physical CD. Okay. Because Digital. I think you know that time was was up, but it was released on streaming platforms, uh, and that was. 2015 and that was just a, a collection of songs that TK had uh, either remixed some of them from um, you know this first album mm -hmm. uh, and some new songs but the the common factor was just uh, TK's fingerprint on them you know? mm -hmm. and so that was uh, the Romaside sessions it was like awesome. an EP yeah, yeah 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 no and so would you say that yeah. uh, I guess there was a strong creative chemistry between yourself and TK on the production side Yes, because um, I've known TK man since he was at high school, <laughs> you know. So that we we go f that far back, um, and so uh, you know, the, there's a time in Lusaka or a time in Zambia when you couldn't really get like a beat that sounded on par with the international stuff. Mm. Um, and so a lot of us, what we used to do was we just kind of like steal instrumentals from existing hip hop beats. But TK was peculiar in the sense that he had a four track recorder and he was making beats and uh, people knew him for that. Mm. So one of my aspirations, even when I was, you know, with the Mannix crew, which was my group back in uh, 94, 95, was always like to work with TK because TK had these beats, you know. And so eventually we, wor we worked together. I think the first time we worked together was 2005. Oh, like I worked together as in he produces the song. Yeah. And uh, it, it had some magic in there. And so each, each time we're building a song ground up, he understands it. When I'm kind of telling him the idea, he picks it up and, you know, uh, he's able to, to translate it into something. 
So I remember with Njota, Njota had like a connotation which I didn't realize when I wrote it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, so so I just kind of had this concept of um, a, a, a lady who has a bad rep in life, but yeah. people misunderstand her. You know, okay. and so that's that's where I was building this song. Yeah. And so when I said, I remember the the day that I was explaining this concept and I told her the beat, then I said, Gatiara Njota. Mm. Then he says, Oh, like a naughty track. I didn't understand what he meant when oh, he said really? that at the time. Uh-huh. I just thought like, you know, like, Naughty, what does he mean? You know, because I, I didn't catch the first connotation, you know, call me innocent. I and see, so, so I see, okay, okay. Yeah. And funnily enough, uh, we were looking for somebody to feature on the song and one of the guys that I, I was like, yeah, there's that dude, I won't mention his name, but he's a gospel brother. And uh, I thought like, you know, he'd be perfect. He's a song about, you know, somebody who's struggling and we can all uh, understand the story. And then the guy's like, okay, so, um, <laughs> I should have got the hint when he refused to be on the track, <laughs> but I didn't, you know. And then only later on did I start, you know, getting all these queries about what the song is really, really about. about. Uh, you know, and, uh, you know, by that time, you know, just it, it was too late. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. So, oh well. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. I th- that that might be part of the reason why it blew up even. Controversy more. sells, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's very interesting. You know, w- one one thematic that's been uncovered a lot on this on this series, and I'd love to hear kind of your perspective on it, especially kind of having, yeah. you know, in some senses, and and then people do give you your, I think your credit for this. You know, you just mentioned how. You know, Zambia Moto is one of the first, I guess, the first track on radio playing and available kind of commercially in that sense that that kind of mm. mixed, you know, Vernac with English. And I, you know, a few yeah, people yeah. have mentioned that about you. But one thing that I'm curious about is your thoughts on hip hop as a genre, especially in those kind of, I guess, mm. earlier days. Did it feel yeah. for you um, in any in any way, shape or form uh, like an uphill battle of any sort? Did you feel like you had to sensitize or sell people on the idea of Zambian hip hop or what was that yeah. like? You know, I, I it's exactly that. Uh, I think when we started out uh, trying to do this whole um, Zambian relevant music um, hip hop thing. Yeah. Um, and and trying try to share that there was resistance in the sense that the the guys that were in the mainstream mm. made it seem like it was a, a genre that's um, like kiddish. Interesting. So, f- for example, I, I tell the story in the book. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, man. I got you my stuff to. organized. Yes. In the book, um, <laughs> there's a part where I mentioned going to ZNBC. They had a, what they called the dubbing studio. So the dubbing studio was a, a big facility where you could duplicate uh, cassette tapes. So I had at the time a demo which I thought would pass for an album. Mm. Eventually I found out I couldn't because the beats weren't mine. Mm. But I remember going to the dubbing studio and the sound engineer was looking, was playing the tape to see if mm-hmm. he could uh, kind of boost the levels and you know make it sound beefy. Yeah. And there was a lady in the room and then she she listened for a bit and then she just says hmm, crisscross and she walks <laughs> out. <laughs> so so you know people. You know, during that period would uh, call us guys who were trying to do stuff my yo, you know. Yeah, what, of course. That. But what we were trying to do is make it relevant because at the end of the day, if you can make the music palatable, if you can make it understood mm. by your, your, your peers and, and yeah. your, your fellow country people mm. because of the fact that it's got ingredients and messages that they can connect with, yeah. then you're winning the battle. So that was the thinking. Mm. But we were facing a challenge because uh, some people didn't understand it. And then our peers were kind of uh, looking at us, uh, you know, side eyeing us because mm. we were using vernac in music, and which was uncool at the time, because you were meant to be, you know, uh, dressed like Jodeci with the boots and whatnot. You know, no, no one, no one wanted to come up with a name like Chandambao as his rap <laughs> name or Chilu Lemba. <laughs> Somebody would, you know, <laughs> Lubinda would be Ramon Sanchez or something, you know, so that it sounds foreign. <laughs> That's funny. So, so in the early days, I think that was the main battle, you know, mm. and it's um, interesting because in 92, we wrote down and I've got, I've got it in my Dropbox. We wrote a letter when I was still at high school where we outlined what we wanted to do with the music, how to, to, to make it relevant and to do all yeah. these things that we're doing yeah. about from the Beach International Workshop. Yeah. So I wrote the document in yeah. 92 yeah. and 
having that resistance and having lived through that mm. i was blown away in i think 2013 when i went back to um the school for a reunion or something mm-hmm. as an old guy now I've got kids and whatnot yeah. and all the music that was playing on the sports field was zambian music mm. like zambian hip-hop and whatnot and so it was a surreal moment um mm. standing there in in kushi at, at chengelo yeah and looking around me and seeing how things had changed from from you know 20 or what 30 years before where it was just kind of like a, a, a dream and a vision but all sorts of people have taken up the um, well the wave has just kind of hit i'm not saying it's, you know it's it's, it's me it's like a whole, yeah. whole lot of um of course, people of in course. different critical mass it all comes have, together have moved yeah. this exactly mm-hmm. to the point whereby i'm standing there and you know slab d's music is playing um and wherever else you know and, and it was surreal I was just kind of standing there looking you know a bit stunned i'm sure people didn't realize what was going on but it was you know it it, it shows you full circle how mm. things have changed so yeah no that's that's great to hear so so i guess your assessment then on the current status quo would be that there's been a market kind of improvement in the perception and and i guess treatment of hip-hop as a genre locally i believe so and um my only thing um which i also kind of chat about in in the book is yeah. that when the initial push and the initial drive w- was uh being championed by you know whoever else was within our ecosystem yeah um the idea was to to make this thing international yeah uh, to to have uh, audiences looking to zambia because we've got some thing you mm. know which which is brewing and what i found is that at the moment uh, it's it's a very localized movement so uh, i i remember a time when i was trying to to kind of summarize it and and i used the the phrases passport music versus nrc music huh. and um that was just kind of you know to, to outline that there's uh, music that can cross your borders and that's yeah. passport music mm-hmm. and then music that stays inside the, the country that's, because that's only so, people know who can a, bug out to it that's yeah, nrc that's, music man that's such a great analogy you know and and it's you know it's a, it's honestly a, it's a very strange phenomenon where like you know it, it, zambia is such a, a trip in that sense but I, I do feel like there's a bit of a dichotomy right and, and mm-hmm. it's and and it's 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 an interesting thing and i'd love to hear your perspective on how we solve for that but but i certainly find yeah. that there is like two parallel universes one in which yeah, yeah. you know we can connect with the rest of the world but to your point you know maybe maybe some local uh, stakeholders are not so interested in having passports they see they don't see passports as so yeah. so relevant perhaps <laughs> you know it's like what am i going to do with a passport <laughs> passport yeah yeah <laughs> I know man and 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 you know it's it's, it's one why of the dichotomy where... you think like well, why haven't we managed to harmonize something you know like because for yeah. example if you look at let's let's take a random case study like jamaica jamaica can have like yeah, yeah really yeah. hardcore dancehall music that's like for them it's their nrc stuff but for whatever reason yeah it's also yeah. a passport it just right? spreads right exactly, exactly. why haven't yeah. we managed to I, th- I think it's a journey you know that at some point will make sense but at the moment what's what's happening is it's bread and butter issues mm. you know if if you make a song which is experimental and might lead us to the promised land yeah um the reality is that your audience right now wants stuff that they'll bug out to on stage when you're at the showgrounds or whatever yeah. mm-hmm. and and so if 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 your formula is to to feed that audience because you know that it directly translates to your earnings yeah. um then you won't kind of have time to you might <laughs> you might want to do one or two tracks that that test the waters but you won't kind of concentrate on on mm. doing something which will blow people's minds i mean you talk about jamaica i'm also thinking at uh you know similarly about sweden yeah like how many musical exports Sports, um, yeah. come through with a swedish connection yeah you know um that that we 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 hear off and we know of so there is it's it's a difficult one i mean i don't have the answers <laughs> yeah no of course of but course. i i just kind of hope that more people will will be brave to to push um you know the agenda i mean i've told the story uh, what what's what's the what's the phrase at nauseam uh, mm. about Roberto and me being in, in Mauritius and and hearing a cover band playing a Roberto song wow. and because they were playing it I thought oh what Roberto's performing here you know because the 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 guy who was speaking in creole said my name is Roberto so I thought oh 
flip. <laughs> Roberto's up, up in the view, view, mm -hmm. but it wasn't him. You know what I mean? Yeah, just like his awesome. music's permeated and, yeah. and, and spread. So it's passport music. Mm -hmm. So there are few examples, but you know, with, with time, you know, hopefully um, guys will pick up that battle. And I know I mean, like, even monitoring what you do musically, uh, without even saying it, just looking at your track record, looking at your collaborations, looking at uh, the, the channels that play your stuff, you know, your mindset is passport music. But at the same time, your mind, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but mm. you've got the uh, passport mindset, but at the same time, you want to put a foot uh, back in the NRC world. Mm. <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's an interesting journey, you know, mm. and, and so I, I'm, I'm watching and, and uh, kind of, you know, from the sidelines cheering on. But it, it's that thing, you know, that, that hopefully will be more uh, stories that we can tell so that it's not just a handful of examples, mm. you know, come five years from now. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I, I definitely agree with you. And, and, and it's, 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 a, it's a wonder. And, it, and, and I, I always wonder why there just feels to be this kind of mutual exclusivity, right? It's, it's almost as if, yeah. you know, it, it, the, the bifurcation is just so marked, you know, and, and it's, mm. it's, it's such a unique phenomenon, I believe, to, to Zambia specifically, because, you know, even yeah. granted, you know, I, I wouldn't, claim to say we're the most developed entertainment or music market on the continent but i just feel that mm. you know other places seem to have a more harmonized industry in that sense or a harmonized content yeah. harmonized music so you know for example in sa you'll have a show majosi right that's or even abba piano mm. right Th these are very locally homegrown that's like as nrc for them yes, as, as it get. gets right <laughs> yeah. but you know, they've yeah. managed to make it a passport. Whereas, I, I yeah. just, I, you know, it's such a strange, interesting phenomenon where here, that w which is of a passport is kind of n not particularly endorsed by the NRC market. Yeah. And that which is of the NRC market doesn't seem it's to fly. Endorsed. Yeah, you know, so <laughs> it, it's such a w strange, unique set of I circumstances. Know, I've, I've, I've got two points now too. Okay. There's okay. one video that you did, which was, to do, I think it was after the Grammys or something, I can't remember. Yeah. But you ventilated a topic on Instagram. Yeah. Which I watched and I was like, this brother's, spot on with his, his analysis and his commentary and i think more people should should hear you know such thoughts um so that's that's the one thing aside but secondly the examples that you've given the um, there's something in the beats as well mm. so if you think of uh, i'm a piano if you yeah. think of dance hall and all yeah. that kind of stuff there's something that's in in in, in the beat and the melodicness and 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 you know those elements whereas when you look at our industry back home it's a lot about the, the language yeah. which we it's it's heavily um, you know um, yeah. the knack in terms of our lyrics mm. which which makes it difficult for a guy from outside the country to catch on mm. you know what I mean whereas mm. if, if we're perhaps I, I don't have the answers like I say mm. if we're perhaps playing with the melodies and the beats more mm. for example I, I say for example a lot but a lot of guys from our um, playing field in Zambia yeah. do not consider mastering their music properly with like proper guys who master stuff mm. and so you find that um I, i'm not mentioning names but there have been some phenomenal tracks from certain guys in zambia which i listen to i'm like this thing will bleed to the rest of the continent mm. but mm. the sound of it is not heavy it's not yeah. like rich because in terms of mastering maybe they went you know uh, to to somebody who isn't world class in his mastering abilities you know mm -hmm. what i mean mm -hmm. um and so that's another aspect that you know somebody should look at um mm -hmm. when 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 you identify a song that can do well you just yeah. kind of think like okay listen there's a guy called um so and so in france who mastered yeah, who uh, david yeah. getter stuff yeah um and it's not expensive for us to send him the the track to beef it up and then send it back to us back, you know? yeah uh so those kind of thoughts i think maybe should also uh kind of settle you know among among the music community